happy Father's Day to you. My goodness, my kids are grown and uh, live out of state, far too far away. We, we uh, kid them from time to time, really kind of only half joking, because we, we had a lot of fun with our kids growing up. So we'll say we, we, uh, we thought you enjoyed our company, but then you've moved to the other sides of the country. What does that say about us? Uh, it's a time for Father's Day humor. Uh, remember the story of the little girl who was talking to her dad and said, Dad, you're the boss around here, aren't you? And he was kind of pleased to hear that. And he said, well, yes, honey, I am the boss around here. And she said, and that's because Mama put you in charge. <laughs> yeah. There was a, a, a female comedian who was talking about fathers, and she said she remembered the year that she gave her dad $100. And she said, go buy something that will make your life easier. So he went out and bought a present for her mother. <laughs> Father's Day. A day for us of those who have had great fathers to celebrate, to give thanks, to affirm if our earthly fathers are still with us, if not to treasure their memory. For some of us, it's a tough day because the relationship that we had was not what we wanted, certainly. And uh, there's a lot of baggage, and we talked about that forgiveness thing last week. Today, as we're, we're talking about this series of life being short, we're trying to talk about how do we redeem the time that we have in this earthly pilgrimage, however short or long it may be. And today I want to start with a passage of Scripture from over in Ephesians. This is from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. I think that's important for us, friends, because I believe it is not God's intention to make life difficult. I think it is God's intention to make life blessed. But in doing so, there are certain things that we need to align ourselves with as we make this earthly journey. And one of those things is being very clear about moral decisions, moral issues, and, and how we're going to align ourselves with God's teaching about that. Because in fact, there are pathways that lead to great blessing, great blessing that God wants to pour out on our lives. There are other paths that may seem good to us that are fraught with danger. I'm going to start with this little video you're going to see. This is from a young adult staff member. The video is not. It's a, a replica of the video that he showed me a few years ago of when he was in California, excuse me, Colorado, on a mountain range and a particular ridge called Knife's Edge. And he showed me a seven-minute video that he did from his head cam as he went across. And this is a video of somebody else going across there, about 30 seconds worth. To, uh, we're going to start showing it right now, and I'm going to tell you a couple of things about it. If you look down, that is 1,250 feet to the ground. And you see that looks like a knife's edge. And see, as they're going along, they're checking all the rocks. What you don't hear is the sound of the wind. It is howling. It is sometimes shifting. And those people are up there going across that thing. He, was, he gave me that to look at. I looked at it all seven minutes. You know, I'm hyperventilating. I know the young man is safe because he gave me the thing. I'm hyperventilating, watching it, getting ready to throw up. I, I just could not imagine. And I'm, I really apologize to you because Lowell is here, not because he's here that I'm apologizing. <laughs> I'm apologizing because, you know, Lowell has this spirit of adventure and challenge, and he just saw that, and he's put that on his bucket <laughs> list now over here. Not me, friends, not me. Now, I want you to think about that. He went across there, but to get back down the mountain, he had to come back across that same knife's edge. How many times do you think you could do that? without the unexpected happening. Living on the edge. Like that parable Jesus told about the wise and the foolish builder, I want you to take note, Jesus did not call 
that foolish builder a bad person. He did say he wasn't wise. He built his house on a foundation that was not solid and secure. It would not stand the forces that this world would bring against it. And so it is as we are faced with moral decisions in our lives. It is important for us not to build our lives on the fault line, to give ourselves plenty of distance from those fault lines. And as uncomfortable as this topic is, I think it's, it's really so vital for us, even if it makes us squirm, we've got to take hold of it and be honest about it. Now, this sermon may not be for anybody in this room, but I want you to know something about worship and the teaching time. The teaching time in worship is meant to resource us as the Christian community, as the family of God. It resources us so that when we're out in our everyday world and God brings people across our path through our relational world, our work world, our social world, we are resourced to be able to speak God's truth, God's love, God's grace, God's hope and promise into their lives. So even if these things do not directly apply to you, they go into your storehouse of God-breathed information, God-breathed truth that you can then use to help somebody on their spiritual journey. Somebody I admire in ministry is a fellow by the name of Craig Rochelle. He is a pastor and writer, and uh, I was reading some of his material one time, and he quoted a survey that I didn't like at all. I did not want to believe it. Now, regrettably, he didn't give me the source of that survey in what I was reading, so I couldn't back check it. But in the meantime, I have seen similar figures on the Internet, and you know, if it's on the Internet, it must be true, right? Yeah. Well, in this survey that he quoted, He said that 65% of men and 55% of women step over the boundary lines of their marriage before age 40. I don't want to believe that. I want that to be wrong. But even if it's a somewhat lower percentage, man, that paints a picture of heartache, of in some ways failure, of destructiveness, because I don't know of anybody who stands, stands before the altar of God and says at the beginning of their marriage relationship, well, in X amount of years, I'm going to stray. I'm going to jump the fence. No, something happens to us. And we need to be on guard about those things, to be wise about our moral decisions. Now, that thing about uh, before age 40, some of us think, well, I'm past 40, so I'm not in any danger. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Because the truth is, it's in those times when I feel most secure that I'm actually most vulnerable. Imagine my young friend Joshua, who traversed the knife's edge. If he did that 10 or 12 times a day, he'd get pretty comfortable doing that. He'd feel pretty confident. He'd be pretty self-assured and before long he would be so comfortable in doing that he may not pay enough attention in his self-assuredness the unexpected could come and could take him down the scripture even says those who think they stand beware lest they fall pride goeth before a what a fall when we think it can't happen to me it can Even if I go to church, I'm part of a disciple Bible study, I'm involved in work projects that bless the poor, yes, it can still happen. It happens to presidents, congressmen, day laborers, church folks. Bad choices are made by otherwise good people. I need us to be anchored in that. Now, right over here is, I think, one of the world's greatest inventions. It is a bug zapper. Got that? Now, you really can't see the light that's in that thing. If all of our lights were out, you would see it has a beautiful blue glow. It it is just, it's, it's kind of mesmerizing for me to look at a bug zapper. And, and I just imagine, I'm a little weird like, like that, uh, I just kind of imagine bugs having a conversation about the bug zapper. And one of them says, oh, man, look at that cool light. Isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah, but you don't, you don't want to go near that light. No, no, no. Don't you remember Larry? Man, he went in there. He never came out. In fact, if you look real close, I think that's his left wing over there. And the other bug says, oh, that's not going to happen to me. Man, what a rush that would be. What a rush that would be. And so he says, hey, watch this. That's what you find on a redneck tombstone. Hey, watch this. 
last words. And so he, he revs up and he goes flying zoom, right on by. And I said, oh, man, that gets your heart pumping. <laughs> that was so good. I'm going to do it again. Yeah. And so he gets down and he goes again and again. And he keeps cutting the margin a little closer, a little closer, a little closer until zap. Man, he's, he heard and he saw what happened to Larry. But no, it won't happen to me. No margin, no boundaries. I'm a, I'm a fly fisherman. I don't know that I'm any good at it, but I do catch fish. And one of the things when I started fly fishing was I, I knew I'd probably run into snakes. You know, snakes like the water and, you know, you're tromping through the woods and all that. And I had lived for the longest time with the understanding that a snake could strike about one-third of its total body length. One-third of its total body length. And so I decided to check that out. And I did a little research, and I was wrong. I found out that the average snake can strike up to one half to three quarters of its body length. All those years, I thought I had a good margin, a good boundary. Boy, was I foolish. So I plant in my head, okay, now think about that. If you're out there, that snake that you see could strike one half to three quarters of its body length. Okay, I don't carry a tape measure. How am I going to know how long he is to figure out that equation? And secondly, what if that's an above average snake? <laughs> What if it's Snakey University, he not only lettered in long-distance striking, but he set the school record? <laughs> Friends, I wish, I wish those temptations, I wish those decisions would come clearly marked so that we could see them. But they don't. They come subtly, innocently. I had a dear friend who was a mentor to me, a mentor to me in nonprofit work. This was before God finally got God's way and got me in ordained ministry. And this was a nonprofit agency that, that he had uh, started, and it was great with kids. They did sports programs for kids. He was a charismatic kind of guy. He really did great, great work. And as you know, in a nonprofit organization, you got to have a lot of volunteers. You don't have enough paid staff, so you got to have lots and lots of volunteers. And there was this, this woman there, and she was a great volunteer. She was a, a school principal, an elementary school principal. She believed in the goals of this nonprofit. And to Together, they had a lot of horsepower. He had a beautiful family. She had a beautiful family. But they were spending lots of time together, and they were doing good work, and kids' lives were being impacted for good. But instead of staying on track with the agenda, they developed an emotional attachment over time. And that emotional attachment got stronger and stronger and stronger, and the margins were reduced and reduced until lines were crossed, decisions were made. And there was a terrible price to pay, personally, professionally, organizationally. That nonprofit, fledgling as it was, almost folded because of their unwise decisions. Friends, you don't have to be a bad person to make a foolish choice. It's a story as old as the Bible. Old as the Bible, there's David. David, that shepherd boy we all know, the 23rd Psalm kind of David. Killing Goliath with that sling, David grew up to be the king, David. And the scripture tells us that one year, during the season when the kings go out to war, now that's another way of saying it's kind of in the the time of year where marauding arm, armies are apt to encroach the boundaries, steal crops and things like that. And the king's responsibility was for the safety, stability, and security of the kingdom. So David, as the king, should be out there riding patrol with his troops, being sure that the country was safe. But the text says he was in his palace. He wasn't staying focused on his responsibilities. 
and he goes out to his veranda, and as he's overlooking the capital city, he looks down, because it's a high and lifted place, he looks down, and he sees a young woman taking a bath on the rooftop. Now, friends, that wasn't an out-of-the-way thing. That was something that was done then. But instead, instead of averting his eyes, instead of turning his back and going back in the palace, he lingers. He lingers. Now, I'm going to hit the pause button. I'm going to say something I really want you to remember. I want you to remember these three words, thoughts, attitudes, and behaviors. Our thoughts shape our attitudes, and our attitudes shape our behaviors. David watches her bathe. Now, we already know he wasn't looking after his responsibility. Something's going on with David. Maybe there's a spirit of discontent in his life. Maybe he's bored. Maybe he's wondering what it's, if, if this stuff is just even worth it anymore. But he sees something, something that interests him, something that gives him a little rush. And he entertains the thought. He entertains the thought. After all, he's the king. He works hard, works hard. People have no idea of the level of responsibility and the pressure he feels. He deserves a little something extra. He deserves a little something. So with that kind of shift in thoughts and attitudes, he adopts a behavior and sins for Bathsheba. He's the king. She cannot refuse. And she comes, and boundary lines are crossed. And she ends up pregnant. This is bad, even though David's king. This is bad. Even for a king, it's bad. He's got to come up with a plan. He's got to do damage control with this. Well, you see, her husband, her husband Uriah, is a member of David's army. So David comes up with a plan. I'll just, I'll just go have Uriah come in for a little R&R, R&R. He'll want to come home. He'll want to see his wife. He'll want to enjoy the, the sense of marital bliss. His husband and wife are reunited and enjoy that time. And then she can claim that the baby is his. That's a good plan. It's a good plan. But when Uriah comes, he says, King David, you've been very gracious, but I'm not going to my house. Until the men under my command can have the same privilege as me, I will not go in my house until they can be reunited with their family. Now David's in a fix. He's in a fix. Thoughts, attitudes, behavior. Thoughts, attitudes, behavior. His thoughts turn dark. His attitude says, I've got to find a way. He loses his moral sense of responsibility and he adopts a plan he tells his commander put Uriah at the front of the line in battle and withdraw support so Uriah will be killed and he was and David thought he'd gotten away with it, thought he'd gotten away with it till one day a prophet came in, a prophet that David respected, and that prophet told him a little story. And at the end of the story, he called David out and said, David, you're the man who's crossed the boundary line. You're the man who is guilty. And David, to his credit, took responsibility and recognized his wrongness. And though it brought havoc there was yet a pathway through. Friends, the Bible is very clear. It says very simply, be sure your sins will find you out. And they will. It's this way we are as human beings. What we don't recognize is that, that you and I have a certain amount of energy, relational energy. And that energy in our relationship with our spouse is, is meant to be uh, focused and reliable and mutually exchanged. It's kind of like as we exchange this relational energy, it replenishes us. We give, but we're also being replenished from the other person. Now, what happens is sometimes junk gets between us. I've been married a long time, 48 years this August. My wife's sitting right out there. But she'll be the first to tell you, the first to tell you, it is not always sweetness and light. Sometimes the relational flow between us gets interrupted because junk piles up. It does. Now, here's human nature. If the junk piles up so the relational energy can't get through in an undistorted way, it leaves us with a kind of hunger. And sometimes, as we talked about a week before, sometimes we human beings, when we're not getting what we want, we withhold. 
that which we would give. Now here's the other dangerous spot. When that junk is there, when that withholding is occurring, it is weakening the life of the relationship. It is weakening the life of the relationship. If there is ever a time where even more emotional energy ought to be poured into this to get this cleaned up, to get it cleared out, that's the time. But it's also this time when it's blocked and it's convoluted that we tend to be unsatisfied and it's like a hunger. And that emotional energy can begin to be diverted, diverted. So there's even less available. And eventually, the relationship can and often dies. And that diverted energy inappropriately is being channeled somewhere towards someone else. We are called to be wise. We are called to recognize what's going on with us. Now, I want to say this. I want to say it very clearly. I want to say it very carefully. It is possible. This is for Mary, folks. It is possible for you to feel an attraction for someone other than your spouse. It is possible. It is humanly possible. But it is totally unwise for you to pursue it. It is totally unwise for you to allow your thoughts to continue to dwell on that to the extent they begin to shape your attitudes and end result of behaviors that are totally out of bounds. Martin Luther, the founder of uh, the Lutheran Church, used to say, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from building a nest in your hair. You can't stop a thought from coming in your head, but you don't have to entertain that thought and allow it to continue. So what do you do when you feel an attraction to someone beyond your spouse? I hope you have a, a wise, mature Christian friend that you've given permission to speak into your life that you could speak to and you could say, hey, I'm, I'm kind of feeling warm and friendly toward that person. And you would trust them enough to say, whoa, back the truck up, Jack. That's crazy. You know, zap. I tell you what, if you don't have a friend like that and you're feeling warm and friendly, you know, kind of attracted to another person beyond your marriage, tell your spouse. They'll help you out with that. Hmm. <laughs> you see, friends, you see, friends, that old saying, a moment on the lips, forever on the hips. Oh, my goodness. Momentary pleasure, momentary fill, long-lasting consequences. Oh, my gosh. I should have done one on pressure of time because I'm feeling it. <laughs> this, this next is, is, is for married folks. It's for single folks. It's for young folks. I am so concerned these days about social media and the internet. They can be good things, they can be powerful things, they can be productive things, they can also have a very destructive influence. And I'm gonna to talk to you about inappropriate websites and you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that. I had a pastor friend of mine said, well, I can't say they're not interesting, but they're not healthy. There are better uses for our time because, you see, if we're on those inappropriate kinds of websites, we're setting our spouse up for failure. It is another way that diverts the emotional energy away from this relationship and into a pseudo-relationship that is never lasting, that is not substantial, that cannot ultimately sustain life. And you get in some of these social, uh, social media uh, chat rooms, et cetera, you connect with somebody. Oh, man, they sound wonderful. They're great. They may be a till of the hun, but they sure do type good. And I'm going to condense this. Uh, the last thing I, I want to uh, uh, say is to, to our young folks, you got to hear this from my heart. I... I really do love you. I may not even know your name, but I love you, and I know that you are in one of the most challenging as well as exciting times of your entire life. Oh, my goodness. The choices are just huge. And I just ask you to, to look at that Ephesians passage and be wise. 
One of the things that concerns me is something that uh, goes on with our, our, our iPhones and other smartphones. Smartphones can really help us do dumb things. They really can. And uh, I, I hear about this on a regular basis. Uh, young women uh, talking about their, uh, their fellows, their boyfriends say, you know, I sure would like to have a picture of you. I, I'd like a picture that reveals your full beauty. I promise I won't show it to anybody. I won't show it to anybody. No, you can trust me. Mm. A few years ago when I was in college, <laughs> we did not have the iPads or tablets. Well, we did have tablets. They were stone, but they were tablets. <laughs> And in that all-male, unconditioned, unair-conditioned dorm, you could go down the hall, and you could go in a room, all the rooms were cookie cutters. You had a bunk on this side, a bunk on that side, and a bulletin board above the bunk. And on a lot of those bulletin boards would be a Polaroid picture. Now, you don't have a clue what a Polaroid picture is, so I'm going to tell you. A Polaroid picture was magic. It was magic. You see, you took this camera, you took a picture, and then you pulled a tab, and out came a layered piece of paper. And when you pulled the paper, top layer of paper off, a picture would develop before your eyes. It was amazing, amazing. And on those bulletin boards, I would see pictures of guys' girlfriends in their full beauty, pictures that their boyfriends had said, I'll never show it to another person. You can trust me. If you loved me, you'd do that for me. These days, while a Polaroid picture had a shelf life, it would be destroyed. That was the end of it. What we do now stays there forever, forever. Young ladies, I want you to know your young man may have the best of intentions, but you also have to know he is not well practiced enough at making wise decisions on a consistent basis to be fully trusted. He is not. He may come to be, and young men, I'm not giving you a pass on this. You need to be an honorable man. You need to be a godly man who respects and protects the person with whom you are in relationship. God wants that for you. God wants you to have a good life. He wants you to have a relationship that is strong and enduring because life's stresses and strains will be tough enough. The world, the world acts to tear people apart. We need not to be engaged in thoughts, attitudes, and behaviors that give the world any foothold, that give them any leverage to damage our hearts and to damage our relationships. I want you to think about this one last verse of Scripture. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Lean not to your own understanding. Because our understanding is so often influenced by the culture. The culture says, these biblical principles are old-fashioned. They're out of date. They don't make any sense. You ought to just be free to do whatever you want to do. As long as it makes you feel good, just go ahead and do it. This verse says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. He is the trustworthy one. Because intention, his intention toward you is good. So here's what I want to invite you to do. Some of you know right now that, that you've been out of bounds. Maybe you're out of bounds right now. And I want to be clear, that's not God's will for you. But I also want you to know God's intention toward you is good. The intention is not to condemn you, but to redeem and restore you. Today may be the day when you make a choice that your thoughts, attitudes, and behavior are going to take a totally different path. You ask God for cleansing. You ask God for forgiveness. And you allow yourself the grace to begin again. 
And as we play this last song, there may be those of you who are married or single folks or young folks who who just want to kind of say, you know, I want to re-up about this. I do want to be an honorable person. I want to respect and protect those people with whom I'm in relationship. I want to be a godly person that God can trust with a relationship that God can truly bless. If that's what you want, you can certainly make that commitment there, but if you want to just kind of seal the moment and just come forward and stand or kneel at this place and say, here I am, Lord. I do want to trust you with all my heart and lean not to my own understanding. I'm going to acknowledge you in all my ways and I'm going to trust you to direct my path. Would you pray with me? God, you know our hearts. You know our desires. We give you these moments and pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to work among us, work within us. Reveal to us that which we need to deal with and release repent and the path we need to embrace. Amen.